late spring 1998, Howard County, Indiana. The rural Midwestern farming region was already enduring its first heat wave of the season. Those who weren't farmers stayed inside to avoid the heat. Hello? 21-year-old Anita Woldridge was one of them. Um, could you hold on for a second? Thanks. She planned to have lunch with her grandparents and boyfriend before her afternoon shift at a shipping company. Her boyfriend was supposed to pick her up at around noon. I have to go. Okay. But she would never make it. At about 12.30, Anita's mother returned home from work. She was surprised to see her daughter's boyfriend standing out front. Anita's car was gone, but it was unlike her daughter to miss an appointment or to leave the garage door. Her mother also noticed that the screen from the kitchen window that faced the garage had been removed. Perhaps someone had broken into the house. The front door was unlocked. Anita! Anita was nowhere to be found. Anita! Anita! In the kitchen, Mrs. Wooldridge spotted blood on the kitchen table and floor. Oh my god. Uh, yes, uh, I need... She called 911. Howard County Sheriff's Chief Detective Steve Rogers responded to the call. I don't know that any of us really knew exactly what we had at that time. We just knew that we had uh, some very suspicious circumstances. We had what appeared to be uh, a possibly a forced entry and that the screen had been removed and that some blood indicated that there could have been a violent act. The detective issued an APB for Anita and her blue sedan and called in a forensic team that included officers from the nearby city of Kokomo. Technicians recorded the scene while the evidence was still fresh. They retrieved blood from the kitchen, but could not determine if it was Anita's without a sample from the missing girl. The screen found in the garage had been forced out from the kitchen window. Investigators dusted the area for prints. None that were lifted yielded any clues. Detectives interviewed Anita's parents to learn more about their daughter. They described her as a responsible young woman who held a steady job and who would never break plans without calling. We had a missing person that was responsible and would not have just run off. We found nothing in our uh, interviews with witnesses, uh, talking to family members that Anita had any problems at home, that she would have just taken off without any explanation. Okay, good. The detective questioned Anita's boyfriend, who she had been dating for several months. He claimed to have arrived at Anita's at about 11.45 and had been there for 45 minutes when her mother pulled up. Before that, he had been with friends until around 11. That left 90 minutes during which his activities could not be corroborated. He had no idea where Anita might be and agreed to come to the station for further questioning if necessary. Authorities examined Anita's bedroom. Mrs. Wooldridge pointed out that Anita's work clothes were still there. She spoke to her daughter's supervisor, but he said Anita had not yet arrived. The supervisor's name is Mr. Johnson, 451-2345. The detective called again to see if she had ever shown up. Her employer, told us that you know she shows up when she's got a cold, she works when she's not feeling well, she's very dependable, uh, and then the fact that she didn't show up for work that particular day was very significant. Mrs. Wooldridge said that the only thing missing from Anita's room was a red bathrobe that she had recently embroidered for her daughter. Forensic technicians retrieved hair samples from Anita's brush to begin the lengthy process of mapping her DNA. In the bathroom, Anita had left her glasses and contacts behind. She couldn't drive without them. But her car and her keys were gone. 
Mr. and Mrs. Woldridge had also discovered that their bed had been stripped of its comforter and the sheets were rumpled. Investigators suspected that Anita may have been raped there. 